is uh, from VCU in Virginia, and Connor is out in the warm country of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and I'm hoping that Mel from Cedars and um, Anna from Mount Sinai in New York City, Anna could be buried under snow. Um, and I just want to start this session off with a couple of polls. I just want to see what people are thinking these days. All right. So here we go. Social Heart, a good tool to have available. Um, so most people said yes. One lonely person said no. I'm not going to make you um, say who you are. Um, but again, it's uh, and, and people are entitled to believe um, as they choose. We're not going to force this on anybody. We do want to make sure that um, you and your patients have options, however. Do you think that TAH can help patients get to transplant more quickly? Uh, so I think we're probably at a 50-50 split. And I have to say, in recent conversations with some physicians, um, both new and current users, they would agree. Um, and it's primarily because of the changing of the UNOS designation, the new UNOS rules. Um, it's easier to get people a transplant if you put them on ECMO or um, another type of um, device because they stay listed at status one. Um, but you're going to run into patients that, that can't live on ECMO for weeks. Um, this, this has started to become a very niche project. And, and I want you guys as frontline providers, because that's what you are, to start thinking of what types of patients um, are more suitable to TAH versus having them be on ECMO for a week or, or maybe 10 days. So what was the answer to this? Um, all TAH patients are status two, whether they're in the hospital or whether they're discharged home. So um, TAH patients need to be listed for transplant. So as a rule, no, they don't need to be listed. They do, however, per the FDA regulations, need to be transplant eligible. Again, that gets us into a little bit of a gray zone, but these questions are here to get you guys thinking. They're sort of get you thinking questions. Um, and having them listed may be a transplant center criteria. So per the FDA, these patients only need to be transplant eligible, but your center may deem that if you get a TAH or in order to be eligible for a TAH, you must be listed. Can TAH be used as bridge to decision? Per our FDA labeling, no. Again, you have to be transplant eligible. The intent must be to transplant. Does that mean that we don't do that? And when I say we, that's the royal we, that's, that's providers in the field. 100% people are doing it. So once you get into you know, your hospital and hospital decisions, that's up to you guys. I just can't tell you and, and promote use for bridge to decision. We are FDA labeled as bridge to transplant. Hi, you're it. Can everyone hear me okay? You, you're coming across fine. Yeah. All right. So um, this is a 32-year-old male that was uh, implanted with TAH back in 2018 for a uh, viral non-ischemic non cardiomyopathy. Um, and um, the initial plan was to transplant. Um, he transitioned to Freedom Driver fairly easy, was discharged home, but within six months started to kind of exhibit um, some behaviors um, that unfortunately made us not be able to list him for transplant. Um, but this was even before. We were not even the initial implanting center. This gentleman was implanted. Um, at another TAH center and actually went to one or two other centers before he finally ended up in Virginia and is now currently under our care. Um, several issues that we've had with him, he managed to get on a plane and fly with his TAH without telling us. Um, that was pretty impressive. Um, he continues to shower uh, with his equipment and Freedom Driver on. Um, He's had four CBAs, TIAs, uh, is currently smoking, and as a result of, um, of all this and having had the um, TAH since 2018, 
he's now having issues with constant cannula fractures. He never wears his binder. Um, the cannulas are like dark brown, probably from smoking and not taking care of them. And then um, does not really communicate with us when he's traveling or even moving out of state. <laughs> um, so just just the, the huge issue of noncompliance. And so we just kind of wanted to open up what maybe some of you all have experienced with patients and what you would do with patients like this that exhibit this kind of um, noncompliant behavior. So, and that was the beginning. Honestly, that was probably the first genuinely um, naughty thing that he has done. Um, and it's just, honestly, it's gone downhill from there. Um, and, and as with any other patient out there, right, when you guys screen for transplant, I mean, this guy was worked up for transplant and he was approved for transplant. So, you know, he went through the ringer, right. With, with questioning in his family. I mean, he was a young man with a very good job at the bank of America. His mom was also in banking. It seemingly had good family support and, um, you know, I think, again, this goes back to when you're not feeling well and you're debilitated, you tend to be a little bit more of a yes person, right? And the miracle of the TAH is you start perfusing everything and you start feeling better and then you want to test the boundaries, right? I mean, so that is both the blessing and the curse of the TAH. I mean, this guy felt so much better. Bring, uh, we make our surgeons do like the driveline resection. So they'll come in and we bring our patients in through the ER. Um, we have admitted them afterwards if we're concerned about them, but um, there's also been times where we've resected them and they're, we, you know, we fix the driveline fracture and then we, everything looks good. So we send them on their way, we send them back home and, and then, and they do fine. So these patients, they're just going to live their lives. I saw, I saw a comment here from Jen Hodge because Jen Hodge also was gifted with the presence of this gentleman and his alarming freedom driver um, because he decided to take a field trip to South Carolina and not tell anyone. And then he had a problem. And MUSC was the closest like large transplant facility for ever. And so, you know, I texted her, I said, Jen, I'm so sorry. This is coming your way and there's nothing you can do. You have to listen to the alarm and just get him out. Because if you don't have drivers and, you know, stuff, equipment, you get to listen to the million decibel alarm that you can't turn off, right? I mean, all we can do is offer guidance. So Will Bradley said, I'm sure we've all had patients like this. And I think all you can do is continue to offer guidance and support the patient as best you can under the circumstances. And that is 100% correct. We, and document, 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 document everything, um, which we are all doing. Um, that, does anybody have any questions or anything else that they want to talk about? I think like a lot of people have already mentioned, I think it's good to remember um, at the end of the day, we don't know what it's like to live with this device. It's not an easy device to live with. And I, I can only, I mean, I can't even begin to imagine maybe the frustration of waiting for a heart and living with this device and what they have to go through. And sometimes you have to take a step back and just remember, you know, this, this is a challenging situation and device to live with. Um, I mean, it doesn't always excuse the behavior, but at the end of the day, these people are adults. They can live life the way they want to live. Um, and like you said, all you can do is continue to educate, guide them, and just hope they'll make the right decision. But at the end of the day, it's their life to live. Um, I think the good news is these people are out living their lives, whereas pre, um, pre-implant, they probably wouldn't be doing this, right? They, didn't, they wouldn't have enough energy to become rebellious. And to get out there and hop on a bus and tool around South Carolina. We do have a question. Um, how many patients do each of the expert centers currently have on support? So, uh, Katie, tag, you're it. Actually, uh, down to just two. Because um, I will say, we, you know, with the change in the UNOS listing, we've really seen a decline in implants. So, 
we're down to just two out in the community. Uh, Connor? Um, we actually have three patients right now on support that we have just right. implanted this year. So we, we transplanted our last TH patient at the end of 2020. And then so far we have three implants that we're working with to try and get to transplant and get them out of the hospital, so. Okay, Anna. Uh, we actually only have one patient on support right now. He was implanted not too long ago and is currently just transferred to our step down unit. Brilliant, wonderful to hear. And Mel, I saved the best for last. <laughs> We actually don't have anybody on support. We transplanted, I mean, the guy waited two months at home, um, the last one we did last year. Um, but what I was going to say about the Freedom Driver too is we actually have a consent for the patients before we transfer them on Freedom Driver um, so that they know all the, um, you know, possible things that can happen just because our institution is very, litigious but that's maybe that's a good idea that's something that other centers should think about because it's almost like a contract right i mean it's non i'm sure it's non-binding you know but, in court of law, but it's still you know it kind of emphasized to them that this is a, an onus of them as well as you know what else can happen? You know, it's it's. Uh... Um, next question I have is: It's incredible how this guy is still alive. I have only seen three TAH, and they died before transplant. One developed bowel ischemia; it can happen. Um, the other had open chest times three for compression syndrome, and also developed bowel ischemia. And the last one, multi organ failure. Sadly, I've never seen someone recover after surgery. So, um, yeah. So. Here's what I'm going to say about that, and panelists, please jump in. The outcomes and the sequelae are heavily influenced by what these patients look like going in, right? So if they're, pardon the use of my term, a train wreck going in, they're going to be a train wreck coming out. This is not a Lazarus device. So that being said, we also don't want to put it in someone who really doesn't need it, right? So there is that sort of gray area of when is when is it too late? What is too late? Um, and I think, you know, um, hospitals tend to be a little conservative and they tend to, you know, hold everything close to the vest for a multitude of perfectly good reasons. But then suddenly the patient will take a really bad left turn and then it's a 911 emergency and they want to implant. And it's at that point, you know, I, I always try and share with my accounts going in, if they're bad going in, they, they're probably going to be pretty ugly coming out. So one thing that I have learned personally over the past 13 years is earlier intervention leads to much better outcomes. Um, and if we um, have a question here from Jesse Ann, um, our center is two for two TAH to transplant. Yay. Uh, any success with centers getting these patients into inpatient rehab or cardiac rehab, or only option is rehabbing at home? So, so ironically, uh, Connor, go. You've got a good patient. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I can speak uh, very closely with this. So, I mean, inpatient rehab has been very, very hard. I mean, we even have, you know, a banner rehab in the same parking lot and working with them is, is tough to get these patients in there. We have in the past, but, um, uh, but lately it's been, it's been a struggle, but cardiac rehab has been, been great. I mean, for whatever reason, we've always, we've reached out and they've always been very excited to, to take these patients. We go out and we do hands-on education with them and, you know, make sure that they have a, a good phone number to call if they have any questions and, We'll even sometimes bring in the patient with us when we go do education so they can meet them beforehand and, and see that maybe it's not quite as, as scary as it sounds on paper and, and kind of get them prepared for that. And so just trying to support them as much as possible. And so far, we've had a lot of success and uh, the patient loves it. The, the facility ends up loving it, getting, you know, seeing a new device, a new skill. And, um, and yeah, so it's been going great so far. Next question is, what criteria um, does your institution or surgeons use to determine when it's time to implant TAH 
and you have seen better results post-op. So okay. um, I'll take this one. Um, actually, we look at um, uh, liver function conditioning. I mean, it's really not a salvage device. Um, I think we learned that early on, unfortunately, because we used it as a salvage and never works. So really, Intermax 2, 3, um, we've gotten away with patients on ECMO uh, to TAH, but it's, um, it's a Hail Mary. So it's the same for, um, you know, LVADs, to be honest with you, our criteria for TAH and the caregiver is really, really important. Um, but obviously that falls apart as you all have known. I'm sure all this panel have had experience where all the caregivers go bye-bye um, in the middle of support. You know, sometimes we do um, go in and we have implanted them on ECMO and sometimes we do have success and sometimes we don't, unfortunately. And But um, you're right, I mean, we look at, you know, basically their other organs, how are they functioning? You know, obviously looking at neuro status and, um, you know, obviously the liver is very important with high risk of bleeding post implant and everything. So it's really just, a, <laughs> you know, we, we do it like, like uh, Mel said, we do try to shoot for Intermax 2 and Max 3 if, if, you know, especially if we can't get them by with an LVAD, they, you know, the right heart isn't working very well. So, but you know, sometimes if it's a young young guy and they're, they were strong before, they they weren't frail and they need assistance, we'll try to get a buy with the TH and sometimes it works, so. But the next question I wanted to ask was, how often are you guys following up with your patients when they're compliant? <laughs> so normal TAH patients, what's the type of schedule that you guys set for follow-up? And, and what do you do in those follow-ups? Do you do labs? Do you just do wound checks? Do you just sort of, hey, how are you? What, what do you guys do? And um, I actually haven't had a patient go home in quite a while. Um, the last patient we had on Freedom Driver was transplanted shortly before actual discharge. And um, But our typical schedule is that they would come in once a week, at least for the first month. And if they're really stable, maybe we can spread it out to every two weeks, but typically we keep it up every week. Um, and they see a physician, we do a wound check, we interrogate the device, see how they're doing, kind of go from there. We follow a similar schedule uh, with the, our TH patients as we do with our LVAD patients. So obviously when they're, they're freshly discharged, they require a pretty close follow-up. We do every week for the first month. And then if everything is looking good, their labs are okay, we'll start pushing that out. So we'll do every two weeks for a couple of months and then push it out to every month. And then the sometimes we'll go about every three months without seeing our, our TH patients in the outpatient setting. And, you know, they, they call us, we are always in close communication. We have them get, you know, obviously INRs every week and then have them do monthly labs. Um, but then if a patient is listed and waiting for transplant, they follow up every month just to make sure everything continues to work good. And, and I mean, we've, we've had success. I mean, a lot of uh, over the phone driver changes sometimes, <laughs> you know, patients going out and living their lives, but um, yeah, we know it, it's been good. All right, Mel, when, when you uh, have them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, um, like Connor, we we also follow them the same schedule as our LVADs, except that we don't go three months. Um, we do six weeks. I think that's from the protocol that we had during the Freedom Driver change, I mean, uh, trial. Um, six weeks is a good enough, I think, time. And then, you know, it's it's just, you know, these patients are so hard on their equipment. I cannot tell you how many freedom, broken Freedom Drivers that we had to see. And so it's just helpful to just see them and inspect the um, drivers. And sometimes um, if they are hypertensive, we will connect them to a C2 um, just to see the volume on the right side. Um, but same, you know, drive, drive line and all that good stuff, interrogation. Awesome. Katie, tag, you're it. 
Yeah, uh, very similar to everyone else. Um, you know, that first month, watching them really closely and seeing them once a week and then slowly pushing it out um, and eventually getting them to like a once a month schedule. We also tried to get our TAH patients in for regular follow-up with cardiac surgery as well, not just with the cardiologist, because again, most of these patients, I think the ultimate goal is to get them to transplant. Um, and also, anytime there is an issue with the drive line or something like that, you usually need cardiac surgery involved. So just having them have routine follow-up with cardiac surgery as well as the um, heart failure cardiologist team. And same thing, we interrogate, we look at the device, we check the driveline site out, all that jazz at each visit. I would like so much to thank my panelists for taking an hour out of their day um, to share with you guys.